let me introduce uh, Dr. James Irvin, Irvine for that, who's going to speak, as you see on the, on the screen, about uh, health in Saskatchewan's north. Uh, Dr. Irvine uh, completed his medical school in 1976, and he's actually lived and worked in northern Saskatchewan for many years, since 1981 and he's the director of uh, the University of Saskatchewan Northern Medical Health Services in the early years, and now he's uh, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan's medical health officer um, for several decades. Um, and he covers the North and is a specialist in public health, preventative medicine, and he's a professor in our department here of family medicine and associate member in community health and uh, epidemiology in the School of Public Health. Uh, so uh, I think I can just, uh, the last thing I'd say is he's a recipient of the Saskatchewan Health Care Excellent Award, and I believe I'm reading this off your, your information too. So without further ado, I'd like to have Dr. Irvine come up. Thanks, thanks very much, Charlie, for that uh, introduction, and, and thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to, to speak to you this morning. Yeah, so I'm a, I started off in La Ronge as a family doc, um, and then through uh, specialization in public health, um, and for a short term was um, the director during the early stages of the Northern Medical Services with the university, um, and then uh, became full-time medical health officer subsequent to that. Peter Butt, who's uh, coming next, um, took over as a director of the Northern Medical Services for some years and then provided uh, solid leadership. And then more recently, Dr. Veronica McKinney. So I want to sort of give you a, a real quick whirlwind tour across geography, but also across time, uh, going from sort of the past to the future, and give a bit of a sort of a glimpse of the future as well. Um, so a number of you around the room here have had experiences within the North, uh, and so I want to sort of build upon that or, or complement your, your experiences. So what I'll be talking about is sort of the northern half of the province it used to be referred to as the Northern Administrative District Line, that uh, south of the line were rural municipalities. North of that line, they used to break that area up into conservation blocks and fur blocks. So some of the cancer studies we did in terms of looking back in the history in terms of cancer, we were looking at geographic areas in terms of fur blocks or where our populations were. But it's a population of about 40,000 uh, across half the surface area of the, of the province. So it's roughly, well, it's about 50,000 kilometers bigger than the whole uh, United Kingdom. Um, so, so it's a very sparsely populated area. Three health regions that I work with, the Athabasca Health Authority, Kuwait and Yate, and uh, Mamawit and Churchill River. So it's boreal forest um, in the sort of that La La, Shia La Crosse, Beauval area, it's, it's boreal plain. And then from La Ronge north, it's more shield, so added to the rocks and water um, and, and trees. Uh, First Nations have been there for millennium and they've talked about uh, the different uh, linguistic groups, the Dene, uh, which is the Athabascan uh, language, covers a broad area. And the interesting part of it is that al also there's very comparable linguistic groups uh, with the Navajo and the Apache. So the Dene in northern Saskatchewan uh, can understand the Navajo um, and Apache uh, there. So there's, there's solid links between them and a number, number of different projects we have going on. The Dene Shulen, which is one subgroup of the Dene, uh, has, has communities, Métis and uh, First Nation communities in Manitoba, Northwest Territories, and uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. The Cree, uh, there's a, a fairly large overlap of the Cree and the Dene communities. Uh, the predominant Cree language is the Woodland Cree, although in Cumberland House there's the Swampy Cree and then more towards Beauval and uh, Canoe uh, Narrows, uh, it'd be more the, the Plains Cree. The Métis, uh, in terms of the, along with the Métis Sash, with their language, and Michif, uh, very strong communities within the, the predominantly the west side of the province, but also uh, towards Cumberland House. 
Now, when, it, when we look at some of the history of Saskatchewan, and we often forget about the, the idea that the first connection within the province is often along the highways, and the highways at those times were water. Um, and so the, the, some of the strategic locations in which uh, predominantly Métis communities were developed through the fur trade is that Cumberland House and Isle of Cross were the first two communities within our province, coming about 2,000 years before, or sorry, 200 years before Saskatoon. So those were the two oldest ongoing um, inhabited communities within Saskatchewan. And I'll just talk about the hospital creation in, in the, uh, later on in the talk. Wanted to share with you some of the sort of the community characteristics, uh, the population, the geography that we have, because uh, it certainly influences health and health, health uh, outcomes. So it's a vast area, beautiful um, uh, uh, scenarios uh, with rock, trees, water, great canoeing area, great kayaking area, uh, tremendous fishing, um, and it's uh, quite sparsely populated. We have 12 First Nations uh, in about 21 communities across the north, um, as I mentioned, predominantly Dene and, and Cree, uh, and 35 municipalities. So a lot of those municipalities are in a few hundred people, or uh, the biggest one would be about 3,000. 3, Some of them are road accessible, more and more of them are, uh, but there's still a few that are only accessible by ice road or by air. So this is the scene that you'd see as you're leaving Uranium City to head on south to, to La Range. And it's sort of the looking forward on the ice road of uh, seeing nothing but ice. Uh, and the sign that says uh, La Range is 846 kilometers away. So that's within one, or, or 346 kilometers away is all within that one uh, geographic area of, of the areas we cover. There's been remarkable transition within the within the population of the north. Within a, a few decades, there's been amazing change in, in, in lifestyle. Our population in the north is changing. The, um, the diagram on the left shows the population pyramid about three decades ago, showing a very uh, wide, wide base of young, young children. Even today in 2015, um, even though we are getting more uh, population within the middle age group and our elder population is increasing at a rapid, more rapid rate than it is in the province. Uh, we still have a very broad base of lots of young infants. So this is the Canadian equivalent of that pyramid. So really quite a remarkable change between this and that. So you can see how uh, uh, things that you see within a community uh, is very different to what you see on the ground. Uh, you see lots of young kids, lots of adolescents, uh, whereas in, in Canada it's quite, quite different. And that influences the things that you see, the type of work that's being done, and the types of efforts that are required. The median age in, in the north is about 24, uh, compared to 40 for, for Canada. Also, when you think of uh, different communities, you think of the Aboriginal uh, population. In northern Saskatchewan, there's a rear, uh, very rich culture of, of First Nation and Métis people. So in the last census, um, over 90% of the, the, those respondents in the areas of Kiwetnyate and Athabasca identified themselves as Aboriginal. So in parts of northern Saskatchewan, you have some of the highest proportion of Aboriginal people anywhere in Canada. The only one that's fairly close to that is Nunavik in, in northern Quebec. So, so in the province as a whole, we have about 15% Aboriginal people. Uh, in the north, we have uh, about 87% across the three, uh, with almost 70% being First Nation and about 30% of them uh, being uh, off, off reserve. The language. Um, there, there is increasing uh, challenge or increasing concern of the loss of language, but still there's a very significant utilization of Cree, Dene, or Michif in, in the areas of the north. And uh, homes during the last census talked about almost 50% of the homes are utilizing an Aboriginal language fairly regularly. So that, that uh, is an important issue as it relates to culture, 
but also the way services are provided. Also just want to take a few moments to talk about health determinants. Some of the uh, conventional uh, discussion about health determinants and then some other aspects of it, particularly for uh, First Nation and, and Métis communities. This is a, sort of the conventional model that we all are so familiar with in terms of the Whitehall study, um, looking at you know, uh, individual lifestyle factors, social and community factors, and then general social economic factors. One that I, I like, which, which was um, part of the UNICEF State of the World it's a um, children's report, and this was submitted um, from, from Canada, uh, so Margot Greenwood had a lot to do with it, looking at this, the web of well-being within Aboriginal communities. And the only areas of distinction that I want to point out, because there's a, a lot of similarities for any sort of wheel of, of health and health determinants, but the ones that are really emphasized here are things like land, uh, self-determination, or, or being able to determine um, your own destiny, the residential schools, colonization, poverty, language, uh, and cultural and heritage. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but just wanted to share some of the sort of traditional, conventional uh, determinants, education being one. There's remarkable improvements occurring in education in the North, um, and the statistics are improving, but there's still disparities there. So 50% of the northern uh, population between uh, 25 and 64 have a grade 12 graduation um, uh, compared to almost 90% in other parts of Canada. Employment, uh, we have fairly high levels of unemployment, uh, which is uh, part of the problem with the education part. Um, but the areas where we have employment, predominantly in mining, education, health, other service sectors, uh, supports for uh, community infrastructure and mining, some fishing, uh, timber, and the agriculture is uh, wild rice, harvesting, uh, mushrooms, berry picking, and tourism. We've got lots of people up in the north now scrounging those areas where the forest fires were last year, looking for those rare mushrooms that only occur the, the year after the forest fires. Um, the employment is certainly reflected in the income levels, um, and you see in northern Saskatchewan, as an average, it's about 16,000 compared to about 28,000 for Saskatchewan as a whole. If you add to that some of the costs, and particularly I want to draw attention to the food costs for those communities in the far north, the Athabasca area, that it's almost $400 for a family of four for a, a sort of a, a standard size um, market food basket of, for four for, uh, for a week. And that's twice as expensive as it would be in a place like Saskatoon. Household crowding, and we all know the various conditions that can change or be influenced or increased risk uh, because of household crowding, whether it's a respiratory condition, a tuberculosis, um, mental health concerns, or the ability of a child to, to learn well in school. Um, you can see there's phenomenal differences there between Saskatchewan and, and uh, the a average northern home. So there's almost 20% of the homes have uh, six or more people living in the household. And this doesn't take into consideration the size of the home as well. There is this remarkable culture, this remarkable environment um, and you see why people really take pleasure in, in living off the land and being connected to the land. And there's some, <coughs> excuse me, some of that being lost. The other thing that's changing is uh, the diet. And certainly, you know, the, the, the fast food used to be the fast on foot or fast on hoof. Um, and there's still a, a lot of value being placed on traditional foods both through the nutritional value, but also the social value of connecting, as, as many cultures will do, but also the procurement process. It's often a time of uh, transfer of knowledge from family members uh, during, uh, during that activity of hunting. And this is often what's happening now, is that there is this transition to 
tra transition to non-country foods and and not necessarily to healthy foods, but uh, highly processed food. Just wanted to touch on one of the examples of um, of a health behavior um, with a with uh, with a caution note to it. This is the uh, from the in-hospital birth questionnaire uh, of those individuals. Uh, once they've delivered, they're asked a variety of questions. This is the one in terms of smoking during pregnancy. It's a couple years old, and so the Saskatchewan number of 24% is, is a little lower. But across the north, it was from 50 to 70% of women smoked a little bit at least during their pregnancy. They might not have continued throughout pregnancy, but at least they identified that. And the reason why I want to draw attention to that is that this is not necessarily an outcome or a, a, a sort of an influence itself, um, but it's tied up with other, other social issues. Uh, it may be a symptom of other, other conditions that are going on within communities. This is a few years older, um, in the late uh, 2008, 2010, the National Regional Health Survey, which were for First Nations, really shows that even the smoking patterns were influenced remarkably uh, by income values. Those in the highest income bracket were, were smoking only 17%, relative to the lowest at about 60%. We're also seeing the issue of climate change and other health determinant. Uh, certainly the last few years we've seen uh, increased number of, of uh, storms, you see longer seasons, hotter seasons, and um, impact on fires. The fire on the, the picture here was the fire taken from the airport in Lorange last summer. So that's the tarmac that you're seeing just in front of the, the fire. We also see this past year and some other years the challenges of uh, warmer winters when uh, some of those ro uh, communities that only have access by road um, getting uh, fuel across and the trucks have to come by, uh, by those ice roads or bulk groceries. There's been changes in the caribou migration somewhat. Um, and then <clears throat> this year was an example of uh, rapid runoff in the spring through a rapid melt. Um, especially if there's an area where there's uh, fires in the past and so you lose that capacity of the soil to absorb through the moss. And so we've had increased uh, drinking water advisories because of rapid runoff and in, in increasing turbidity of water. So another sort of factor that you think about climate change, which often doesn't, um, uh, is th thought about often. The other thing that I think is really important to think about in terms of determinants is Lots of discussion about the traditional or the conventional determinants don't really give the full picture um, of what goes on in First Nation Métis communities. And, and really we need to be looking at those other factors and there's the issues of colonization, residential schools, the impact of loss of culture, um, and that impact of intergenerational trauma. Uh, causing the social disrupt disruptions and causing some of the factors that we'll see. Um, these are the locations of the residential schools across Canada and in northern Saskatchewan they are predominantly in, um, for a short time in La Ronge, <coughs> uh, Beauval, um, Sturgeon Landing over towards the Manitoba border and then they, they had um, a, a Métis residential home in, in Isla Cross and in Timber Bay. Now there's been a lot of um, credence given to one particular researcher in the States, that, um, Vincent Villetti, who's talked a lot about the impact of adverse childhood events in, in children. Um, the number of various types of adverse events that may occur in a childhood's life has been shown through uh, studies in, uh, through San Diego, Kaiser Permanente, and then replicated in many other places across uh, northern, or across the States that the increased number of categories a child experiences in terms of adverse childhood events influences that child's behavior during adolescence with risk behaviors, uh, smoking, addictions, uh, et cetera, suicide risk, but also across a lifespan. So they're showing the increased numbers of, of adverse events a child has experienced. It influences things like uh, asthma, depression, diabetes, kidney disease, cancers, cardiovascular disease. Um, and so that's something we need to be thinking about as it relates to some of the adverse events that 
um, generations have had through First Nations communities and Métis communities. This is the spring that we're seeing, again, in some parts of the forest where there, we didn't have the fires. Um, there's always the little lady slippers that come up in the spring, which is nice. So just wanted to sort of reflect now on the um, determinants and what impacts that have on the health status and what, what uh, changes are occurring. Life expectancy in the north is, is about five years different than the Saskatchewan as a whole. This is about eight years um, uh, old, so we're in the process of updating that now. Um, the total mortality rate itself has been improving, a gradual improvement both provincially and, and across the north. The thing I'd like to point out, though, is that the gap itself isn't narrowing. The gap is staying steady. If we also look at just the premature death rates through potential years of life lost, there's actually an increase in the premature death rate across the north relative to the south. We've seen remarkable improvements in infant mortality rates. Um, this is from 1950 up to 1989. A lot of those initial ones were as a result of improvements in infectious diseases. Those improvements continue um, now, the, and we're in the process of updating that again. The main ones that we're seeing over the last few years, uh, if we were able to do some uh, final correction of some of the um, congenital anomalies, would make a, a huge difference here. Um, and some of those are related to very specific anomalies that may occur just within a certain area of the north. Um, the causes of death are, are different. This is the proportion of deaths across the north compared to the province as a whole. And the main difference is, um, one is that the proportion of circulatory deaths is significantly greater in the south. So the cancers are slightly greater. The one that's more significant in the north are, are injuries. Um, this is a pro proportion of deaths as a whole. If you looked at premature deaths, injuries far outweigh those of other conditions. Just this is a, a slide that I shared with an international forum last spring that looked at causes of death in children and, and youth um, in areas of Canada in which there's a high proportion of people identifying themselves as Aboriginal um, compared to the Canadian. And so this is for non-Aboriginal males, uh, First Nation fe males, uh, non-Aboriginal females and First Nation females. With car uh, communicable diseases, perinatal conditions being about double um, the cause of death. For non-communicable diseases being about double. If we look at unintentional injuries, multiple times. Um, for males and for females. More so for, for males, but it's still a very significant issue and for unintentional injuries. So when you think of those determinants of health, um, this is often a, a thing that is one of the outcomes of, of those scenarios. This is some of the work that we're doing on, in terms of suicides in the north. There's a, a coalition working towards uh, uh, improvements in, in these stats, but um, in, in Canada as a whole, suicide is, is an issue, certainly. Um, and the groups that have the highest risk, this is for males, uh, is in the elderly and in the middle age groups. Um, and they tend to be more individual factors, not occurring in clusters. For females, uh, the rates are somewhat lower. Uh, and again, it's that late middle age. This is the stat for northern Saskatchewan from the, the last decade. Um, and it's really very high within that young adult population. It's a rare situation within the elder population within the north. Um, and a lot of these occur in clusters. Uh, so it's a, the behavior of them are different. Uh, and for females, a similar, similar pattern, rare in, in elders. And just wanted to draw attention to some studies that have been done both in BC and Alaska um, that really talk about uh, the fact that in, in BC, for instance, uh, suicide rates are higher in First Nation communities than they are in, in the provincial average. But if you looked at individual First Nations across the province, some of those rates were very, very low, lower than the provincial rates. Other ones were higher. So they looked at what types of factors were the ones that tended to influence that. Why were some communities resistant or had such low rates of, of uh, suicide? 
and they related, this is uh, Chambers and Lalonde, related to identification of indicators uh, showing cultural strength. Things like taking over the control of their own health services, police services, their education, cultural strengths identified within the community. Alaska replicated, replicated that study and they found two main protective factors for suicide within at a community level. One was cultural strengths identified within the community and then the participation in, a, in, a mar in the economy. Chronic diseases, we've seen uh, uh, sort of a development of, uh, of chronic diseases over the last couple of decades. The one that I just want to indicate is, is the one um, looking at diabetes. This is some of Roland Dick's work here showing First Nation rates within the province increasing from 1980 on. The North's rate started after it did in southern parts of the province. Um, and there may have been some protection because of the types of physical activity, the types of eating, the outdoor involvement within the North, but we have, we've caught up. Interesting, in 1937, the Canadian Medical Association Journal had an article by Lillian Ch Chase, with some funding from the Banting Foundation, looking at the increasing rate of diabetes amongst um, the new population within Saskatchewan. Um, and in that study, they were not able to identify any individuals uh, First Nation with diabetes at that time over a period of about 10 years. So this has really been a new uh, situation within uh, the Aboriginal communities. Communicable diseases, we've seen remarkable changes there um, over time, though there are some stubborn and some uh, emerging issues that we're facing. You know, there are still some sort of exotic conditions that we still have. Uh, the rates are cer certainly lower. You know, things like amoebiasis or diphthalobothrium latum, uh, tularemia, trichinosis, things that occasionally come up uh, because of the, the hunting, tra uh, trapping uh, situation. We don't see as much uh, acute rheumatic fever anymore at all, though I touch wood because we've had that uh, cluster of rheumatic fever within the Sioux Lookout Zone in northern Ontario where there's been two deaths uh, from young children from uh, rheumatic fever impacts. And the other thing, maybe not an infectious disease, but it was initially thought of a uh, concern when we saw the pattern of uh, an illness coming forward was hypervitaminosis A. So kind of exotic conditions that are, we, we need to be, uh, pay attention to, but they're rare. This just shows some of the changes within enteric diseases or gastrointestinal diseases that are reportable through public health. And this just starts in the late, or in the early 90s. And this uh, sort of coincides with the time of increasing water supplies, uh, access to uh, water within homes, um, or water being trucked to homes. So we've seen remarkable improvements. And some of these have been, you know, things like amoebiasis, ceremonis, uh, giardia, um, uh, uh, shigella. This is an example of uh, another success. This is hepatitis A. Um, we used to have hepatitis A outbreaks pretty well every summer in one community or another, uh, and often around January. So often times in which families were getting together, they'd be uh, sharing a food, sharing a connection. And we followed the lead of Alaska um, in the, <coughs> the mid-90s and did a specific immunization program only to First Nation and Métis communities um, within the province. And from that time on, uh, so 1997 till today, we haven't had a, another uh, case of hepatitis A. So that shows the value of a specific type of program aimed at a, a vulnerable group. Uh, and we did have several deaths from um, acute uh, fulminant liver disease in children as a result of this during that period while we were waiting for the vaccine to be available. TB is an ongoing issue. Um, certainly within Canada, the rates are going down, and it tends to be more of a, uh, a thing that's being imported into the country. But within Saskatchewan, over the last 10 years, we've had almost 1,000 um, cases of tuberculosis across the province as a whole. Now, despite the fact that the north has about 3% of the population, 
it's had about 55% of the cases of TB. We aren't seeing the people with, you know, uh, spinal deformities of the kibis, uh, the uh, orthopedic problems in terms of the ongoing hip problems, uh, but there's still lots of tuberculosis being found. And the deterrent of health of crowding in home certainly uh, contributes to the spread of that. The other emerging thing has occurred has been HIV. Um, and like so many other indicators, we've, we've lagged behind in terms of the development of some things, uh, but then we've surpassed. So um, our uh, peaking of the HIV rate within the north uh, is somewhat lower or so, uh, somewhat uh, delayed from the province as a whole. Uh, and, but we are reflecting the provincial decline now. Uh, but that will take continuous efforts, especially when you think of the combination of uh, tuberculosis and HIV as a whole. And there's a number of different things that we're doing as a collective and different uh, uh, collaborators across the north to add to the provincial issue of uh, HIV awareness, in decreasing stigmatization and uh, increasing access to care. So the trends in health status are certainly improvements in infant health, improvements in infectious disease mortalities until uh, HIV came around. The infectious disease is still prevalent, uh, emerging like TB and HIV. Continuous high rates of high traumatic deaths, the increased influence of chronic diseases, and then the high levels of smoking. Now this pattern is, and some of the solution and approaches are very similar to other places in, in Canada. So a lot of the partnerships and collaboration are, are with the Northern Territories and Nunavut, uh, Northwest Territories, Yukon. We have a lot of collaboration, a lot of sharing of ideas with, with Alaska, with places like Australia. Um, also with that area that the Dene speak in the southern states uh, because of the Indian Health Service, we have a lot of collaborations going on with them. So I just wanted to touch base on one of the things that have been happening in terms of across the north, but just thought it'd be interesting to look at, at um, where hospitals were developed and the timing of them. It's interesting that the very, very first hospital within Saskatchewan was actually in Isla La Crosse. And that occurred in 1873. A couple other hospitals came after that, but they were temporary military hospitals. Maple Creek, uh, Fort Welsh, uh, Regina, and uh, North Battleford. But really, the first hospital was in La Crosse. Uh, Laloche was somewhat later. Um, it came in about 1943. Uranium City, uh, there's a small outpost uh, place at a mine called, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a place across the lake from Uranium City, uh, Goldfields. And that was moved to Uranium City when that community came. Their first hospital burnt down, and then they built their other hospital in 1954. And then Lorange Hospital came in about 1960. So another interesting thing that in many of the communities, they would see, uh, even though um, uh, places like a Little Cross had a Dr. Lavoie, um, who was around there about 1934, he was the first resident doc within the north. Um, and he did travel as far as Green Lake up to Fond du Lac, uh, very sporadically by air. Uh, but after that, there was a lot of visits for a lot of communities once a year by the, the doctor that traveled with the treaty uh, commissioner going around. So there's medical care once a year, whether you needed it or not. Um, well, one person um, that was involved with the Larange program was uh, Jean Goodwill. Um, or Jean Cuthand Goodwill. Uh, she was the first Aboriginal nurse in Canada. She, uh, she um, as a young woman, was, uh, had, had to spend time within a TV sanatorium. And she uh, took on, or had a number of mentors, um, and she really wanted to become a nurse. So she was in Larange as the, the head nurse of the Indian Health Service there um, in the late 50s, um, before there was doctors. Um, and she came on to uh, play a role in Canada in multiple ways, one of which was the involvement in the Native Access Program to Nursing within U of S and uh, a recipient of the Order of Canada. Subsequent to that, um, there's been lots of 
U of S alumni and faculty involved. There's family docs, a group of docs that were invited, enticed up from their internship at St. Paul's Hospital up to La Ronge in the uh, mid-60s. Another group changed place with them. Uh, another group from St. Paul's Hospital of uh, U of S grads went up to La Ronge in uh, the late 70s. Um, there was itinerant specialists that uh, traveled to the north to do clinics. And it's interesting to think of the types of specialists that were their first up there. One was pediatric orthopedics because of developmental dysplasia of the hips, or what we refer to as congenital hip dislocation. The other one was pediatric cardiology. Is so that because the heart diseases that we were seeing were rheumatic, valvular heart disease. So those were the first two specialists along with the ENT. We had clinical researchers over the years, people like John Gerard, Stuart Houston, Brian Habick, Jim Dosman. Um, and this is just a photo of, from Laloche in 1914, uh, looking at the moss bags that the, the infants were carried around with. That's a very strong cultural aspect of it, but one of the concerns was the very tight binding of the, of the, of the lower parts of the limb. So in 1982, there was uh, the closure of the uranium mine in Uranium City. At that time, the provincial government was having a tremendous difficulty of recruiting to that community, uh, despite the fact there's still a large population with that whole northern top of the province. Isla Cross, uh, despite um, uh, significant efforts, were having trouble with the recruitment. So the federal government and the provincial government approached the university because of some other models based in other parts of Canada and asked if they would take over some of the medical care uh, as it relates to physician services across the north. And so a tripartite agreement was, was created between those uh, three groups. Um, and that's where Northern Medical Services was created. It was, it was um, in the eyes of the un university, um, they felt that if it would be tied together with service, with research and treatment, or and, and, and teaching, that could fit well within the mandate. Um, and of course, the provincial and uh, federal government were much more interested in the service component of it. But the, um, the connections of that were, one, providing family physician services to various parts of the north, enhancing and coordinating the itinerant specialist services, medical health officer coverage, or public health physician coverage for the north, teaching and research and development. Now, northern, some of the northern communities really looked skeptically at this initially. Uh, was this uh, just a passing of the buck of the responsibility of the provincial government and federal government to another southern body? But I think over the years, it's been a remarkable change in that, that perception. Um, there's been other northern programs um, that we worked closely with and learned from uh, and shared ideas, uh, whether it's uh, U, of M, or U of M in University of Manitoba and their northern medical service, northern medical unit, Edmonton into the parts of Northwest Territories, Ottawa programs, to lookout programs, uh, McGill programs, et cetera. The other thing that we found was that there's um, diverse opinions as it relates to the benefit and use of research. There's a real anxiety of enhancing research, but I think as people were getting closer to the recognition of their own involvement as community leaders, of, uh, of uh, getting control of their own health services, there's this recognition of the value and the need for research. So we did create a research and development committee, and some of the people who were on that group became uh, significant leaders within First Nation Métis communities. Some other initiatives um, through the College of Medicine, um, which came on, started earlier on in the, in the time than during the time of uh, Peter Bott and Veronica McKinney has, have increased on. But one of the things that happened was that there's this northern engagement forum that we had with the deans of the health science colleges at U of S, with northern chiefs and Métis leaders, asking about what sort of engagements and what sort of uh, partnerships could be developed further than northern medical services. And it became very, very clear that the the desire of the northern leaders was a more and more involvement with the training of Aboriginal health science students. At that time, um, 
there's an ongoing effort um, between the College of Nursing predominantly and ourselves um, to enhance that program. Tom Martin, through microbiology, was a, another leader in that area, and we were able to get uh, two seats de designated specifically for Aboriginal students. Following that, the dean and uh, dean, uh, the department heads uh, came north for northern tours, meeting with northern leaders, um, uh, learning the teachings of the building of sweat lodges, participating in sweat, sweats, sweat ceremonies. Um, and one of the uh, traditional leaders of the north became an, ha had an academic appointment within the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology. Now those types of things have increased and developed and have moved forward. There's other things, Aboriginal rural and remote, remote health science programs that the deans have, have supported, uh, student run, but uh, supported. There's the Making the Links program where students spend time within the north. And now there's a family medicine residency training program based in LaRange for two, two placements there. There's been the creation of the new hospitals um, compared to those one or two bed um, hospitals uh, within a convent. Uh, they're quite substantial. The one in Isla Cross is a, is a remarkable facility that's combined with their high school, their daycare, um, and other, other community functions. So the physician's model still works with sort of home-based physician services now in uh, Stony Rapids area, um, La Loche, Isla Cross, La Ronge, and then out of uh, PA and, and Flin Flon with visiting doctor services often by air uh, to the various communities around. So rather than maybe once a year, we went down to once a month, now it's several times a week that physician clinics. But really the operation of those clinics are done by primary care nursing. So just with the enhancements of the program where Northern Medical Service was involved with, started off medical health officer coverage was across the north. And then the first areas were Isla Cross and, and Uranium City or that Athabasca area. Um, for the little Losh area is predominantly coordinating the specialist visits. But when uh, we were so fortunate having Peter Butt uh, recruited as a director, uh, one of the big things that we moved forward there was the involvement of the LaRange Clinic uh, because of their challenges of recruitment um, and enhancement of programming as a result. Um, then with consultant programs, uh, the Northern Medical Service got more involved with the family physicians in La Loche, as well as in the Pelican Narrows area. So most of the areas now across the north are coordinated through Northern Medical Services in partnership with uh, Northern Regions and First Nations. During that time as well, uh, the, there's that whole transition from government-led to community-led, and I think the concept of community leading um, the health boards was welcomed so much across the north. They wanted a say in their own health services. And they welcomed that. And the program that I work with, work with um, now with the Population Health Unit works with all, all three of those health regions. First Nations were also very interested in taking more um, control of their services and providing input into that. So Northern Saskatchewan First Nations were some of the first areas of the country to take on the invite of the federal government for health transfer. And there's excellent models that have, have been seen across the North in terms of having more input from First Nations people. From there, they've also joined together um, to provide a Northern Intertribal Health Authority from some specialty program areas so the ones that would require a larger critical mass. Technology um, is improving. Um, we initially, along with Barry Maber and myself, chaired the first initiation of telehealth within the north, uh, from Saskatoon North. Um, and uh, it was well received. Uh, it was not utilized pr probably quite as much as it is today because of the challenges of technology. We did a formal evaluation and. I think we're all kind of sex skeptical about what the elders would feel about this unpersonal uh, approach to, to dealing with uh, your health provider. It was the elders that loved it in terms of not having to travel that far, not being worried about being absent from your family, not being in someone else's office. So, so now that's expanding. We're now getting into the 
the robot uh, in some of the facilities across the north, and Veronica McKinney is really leading that uh, along with uh, Dr. Mendez, and then moving towards things like Doc in the Box and, and things even for our TB clinics and HIV clinics, there'll be more and more of that utilization. This was our first telehealth program uh, that we created. This was back in about 1986. What telehealth meant there was, this is Dr. Ivan Jen doing a dermatology talk to doctors across the north and remote areas. So what we would do is make copies of his slides, mail them out several weeks in advance, we'd all get together by telephone and he'd do a tele, telehealth education session. So we've moved a little bit for far along that path now. Just the role of the uh, public health role, we, we do very similar to public health programs throughout the country. The ones we add to that are uh, things like a lot of environmental monitoring because of uh, industrial development, resource development. We do things like uh, monitoring of country foods, whether it's moose, caribou, uh, fish, uh, ensuring the safety of country foods, do uh, research in groups uh, working with northern communities um, with some of the concerns of congenital anomalies, et cetera. We do have a wide series of reports, often at re community request, and these get really widely distributed. They're sort of health indicators, the state of health uh, within that community specifically, or across the north as a whole. Um, we have some tremendous partnerships to try to work towards the improvement in, in health. This is our Northern Health and Community Partnership, stemmed from the concern of diabetes uh, becoming a big issue in the north and it's expanded beyond that. So it does things like healthy eating, um, active living, uh, positive youth development, uh, um, and smoking cessation, and HIV awareness. So this is just some of the examples. One of the initiatives is emphasis on pregnant women and youth uh, for, for tobacco. Um, we, we have a baby's books and bonding, sort of copied from the Indian Health Services in the States and of Canadian Pediatric Society of, of distributing to every child who comes for an immunization books. Um, and it's because of the, uh, the observation of the lack of liter uh, reading materials that were in many households and the challenges that we faced in early child development. We have also have a program by which um, there's photo shoots taken across the north of positive uh, role models so we can use uh, northerners in a lot of the educational materials that are, that are in place, uh, which I think is so important um, so that people can uh, feel pride in, the, in the, their successes. The, the idea that um, that issue of both residential schools and social um, services uh, taking foster kids uh, in, the, in the 60s, uh, we've had the truth uh, event occurring across the north, across the country, where individuals shared their stories of their experiences uh, in residential schools. The, some people, uh, when you observed uh, these community events with people sharing, some of those circumstances they were sharing for the first time, telling events that happened to them that they had not had the strength to even tell their, their uh, spouse previously. So that was a real important event that occurred throughout, the can or throughout Canada um, and the supports were at those sites. So that was sort of the, the truth part of things. The other thing that's happening now is there's sort of healing that tends to occur in different individual communities. Larange, for example, has a couple things occurring. One, they built a boat that uh, replicated a boat that would take uh, the children down the river across the lake and drop them off for the year at the residential school. At the end of that transport of the elders uh, who were in that boat when they were kids, they had a burning of the boat. The next couple days, starting on Aboriginal Day, they have the, a walk that leaves the residential school in Prince Albert. It's sort of turning their back and freely leaving the, leaving that, uh, the school grounds. So it's a very sort of symbolic measure and then they'll walk from there 
to Larange and Stanley Mission. Again, a healing uh, effort. The other thing that's happening is, and, and this is that 94 calls of action. This is where the rest of us can get involved. And this is the um, 94 recommendations or calls to action for various groups across Canada. <clears throat> Seven of those are directly related to health. Um, though in, I think, a lot of our perspectives, most of these are related to health, health of communities, health of families, um, when you read to education, child welfare, justice. Um, just recently, we've had the, uh, uh, Dean Smith, along with the chairperson of the Mumma Wheaton Church of River Board and Chief Tammy Cook Searson, sign a memorandum of understanding that they would work together in those seven specific ones as it relates to, to health. So I think we've had remarkable recommendation or remarkable um, modeling of social accountability through the College of Medicine. Uh, each of the deans that I've been associated with over the years has, has really modeled accountability, <coughs> whether it's this commitment ongoing commitment of the university, that cultural humility. I think there's Sandy McDonald from the Nunavut who's emphasized these three. And the final was the partnership of equals. So just a little short of time, so I just want to mention one last thing in that there's been some remarkable models that have developed across the north, examples of, of transition. We all know as clinicians different clients and different patients who have been all remarkably resilient and have improved. Pine House was a community that's shown remarkable resiliency. 1977, they had a, a fifth estate video or show on this community, classified as the alcohol capital of Canada. And it showed um, an impoverished community with children, not being cared for. Since that time, this community has made a remarkable turnaround uh, of efforts that they've done. They're, they're um, not entirely a sober community, but very highly sober. They've done the efforts themselves. They haven't had other people come to them and make that improvement. They've had other people provide them support and advice, and they've made the re lead. They have a group called a rock group that's reclaiming our community group. And so it gives you this idea that you know, things can change. Individual patients can change, but individual communities can change as well. So I'll just move forward on a couple of these here. Um, I think just connecting with the past and the future, we'll see sort of more uh, technology used, we'll see more distributive teaching. The, the college has a tremendous role in increasing indigenous healthcare workers and supporting them in the north and across the province. We'll see more um, responsibility for, for First Nations with their health services and that integration of services between regions, health facilities, and the College of Medicine in the future. And hopefully the thing we'll see is sort of increasing the cultural strength and, and wellness and partnerships and relationships between the university and, and various communities across the province. So thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple of questions if Dr. Irvin could answer. Yeah. Thank you, James, for that amazing overview. Um, I guess one of the things I just want to observe and offer and invite your comments on is that uh, uh, I think out of necessity in the North, uh, long before the idea was ever conceived in the South, a more team-based approach to care has been the norm. And uh, I still remember in my early days of service as the registrar, there was uh, a lot of concern about nurses practicing beyond their scope of practice and in reality. I mean, if they didn't do what they did, people would suffer. And so there was a review of that with uh, nursing, medicine, pharmacy. And uh, I still remember having to sign a document saying that we endorsed what was happening, but it could not move further south than Montreal Lake. 
because south of Montreal Lake, doctors were doctors, and you know, in the north it was different. And, and I think we need to humble ourselves and realize that many of the things that people have fashioned in the north really would be infinitely helpful in the south, mm -hmm. but uh, we're too entrenched in our silos. And uh, how could we actually uh, bring the learnings from the north into uh, our, our mainstream mm -hmm. health ideology in the yeah. south? Yeah, I think, I think you're really correct in terms of um, the idea out of necessity, partnerships were developed, both within the health structure itself, uh, with health professionals, but also community individuals too, in terms of respecting the knowledge of the, there within community. And I think it, some of it may occur as a result of the training patterns that we're seeing now, people getting more and more experience in working in those scenarios where they, they have uh, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a pharmacist, a mental health practitioner, in those scenarios. And it might be the situation that the um, graduates as they come forward may actually re demand or go the direction by which they would wish to be employed in those scenarios. Because uh, it's a way by which, whether it's a chronic disease or emergency care, um, the, the model uh, can be very, be solid. Um, there are challenges in terms of the model in the north but those challenges, I think, would be faced by any model that we have. This is probably the best model that would, would work there. And I think for rural Saskatchewan, but also for urban locations, there are many learnings that, that we can place across, uh, across the country. One quick question on this tiny detail that intrigued me. You noted the hypervitaminosis A is a common problem. And I wonder, mm. how did they get it up yeah. there? Have the health food stores got a chain way up to the yeah. north? No, no, um, and it's not a common problem. Uh, it's just one that we saw um, that came as an outbreak of a lot of people coming with severe headaches after having kind of a, a feast situation. And as it turned out, um, it was, uh, we, we suspected vitamin A because of the symptoms. We tested for vitamin A the results were normal. We tested the food that they consumed, which were, was fish liver. We tested them for vitamin A. The levels were normal. That happened again the following year, and we, we tested for a different type of vitamin A that's only in a variety of fish, including uh, jackfish. Vitamin A1 was very high. And so it, this was a result of a high consumption, overconsumption that's usually not traditional. It's more sort of a, what happened in this event. Um, a very specific situation for those jackfish during spawning, uh, so their vitamin A levels are higher. Um, with, with support and education, working with the elders, this does not occur again. But it was the first um, identified uh, issue of freshwater fish causing hypervitaminosis A uh, in the world. There's been some sea fish that have been ca has ca have caused uh, hypervitaminosis A, but never uh, freshwater fish. But it was only because of a high consumption of of, um, of fish liver. But, so, but it's so it's not common. But we certainly have seen it over the last decade, in a number of years. So, but. thank you, James. Yeah. Uh, if I may one, ask one quick question. Yeah. That'll be our last question. Yeah. All right. If I may ask two questions, though. <laughs> uh, spirituality and uh, folk medicine, if you have come across the use up north. I'm sorry? Spirituality mm -hmm. and the uh, use of folk medicine. Yeah. Thank you. I think we, we see a uh, sort of a reemergence of some hidden um, spirituality and, and, and the use of medicines during. Um, the early years, there was the outlawing of, of a lot of traditional activities. Um, and so there are, um, within the north, there is a certainly a resurgent within different areas of the north. Um, there's a difference acceptance into various areas, but you certainly see it reemerging. Um, the use of plants have been fairly consistently used over the years, so there's always that complementary use. Um, but I think the, in terms of the role of, of physicians, health practitioners, and spirituality, there is a, 
a reasonable connection between them. Um, there is a sharing, there's an invite of uh, practitioners to, to participate. Um, there's, in some areas, there's kind of a modification of some of the spirituality, so it can be Christian as well as uh, traditional spirituality. So I think it, it's one of those things that we had a, a big conference last week on early childhood development, and whether it's um, spirituality itself or the cultural strengths and cultural traditions, I think they're all very valuable to be included within some of the solutions that are there for a number of the problems that we see. We had the opportunity in the past prior to government's decisions to close some of our correction facilities in the north where people within those correction facilities were able to participate in cultural activities, including spiritual activities. And it was remarkable to see that impact on those, on those young, uh, young youth as it related to, um, to the, what they would see as, as something that would give them self-esteem and, and pride. So I think those are all, all things that influence health within communities. So thanks, Peter.